this uh, it's time to start our class. Our class this morning is the crucifixion of Christ. And if you would, turn to Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. And we'll read verses 18 to 25, and then we'll read verses 33 to 49. But before we read, I'm just going to pose a question here. What comes to mind, what comes to your mind when you think about the crucifixion? What, 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 what do we think of when we think of the crucifixion? God's love and mercy. God's love and mercy. Yes. God's love and mercy and a sacrifice. What else? What comes to your mind when we think about the crucifixion of Christ? Suffering, yes. Was that pain and suffering? Yes. Anything else? Well, as we as we do this lesson, uh, just keep that in mind because these are all things that we should always be reminded of should always be reminded of these things, the things that he went through, and just remember who he did it for. did it for all of us. <clears throat> in this lesson, we're going to talk about the crucifixion of Christ. And in this event, we're going to look at uh, four points. We'll, we'll learn from, number one, Jesus' obedience, uh, his compassion, his sacrifice, and also what his death meant, means to us. We see parallels of this crucifixion and other gospel accounts. Uh, we won't go to those accounts this morning but um, because of time. But uh, if you would, if you want to jot these down, these are Matthew chapter 27, verses 27 through 56. Also, Mark chapter 15, uh, 16 through 41. And... John chapter 19, verses 12 through 37. <clears throat> We're just going to go ahead and take off here. Uh, verses 18 through 25. Can I get someone to read that far for me? Chapter 23 in Luke, verses 18 to 25. Luke 23, 18? Yes. Okay, now we're going to skip down to verse 33. Can I get someone to read 33 to 39, maybe? And when they were come to the place, which was called Calvary, there they crucified him, and the mouth like this, one on the right hand and one on the other on the left. And then said, Jesus, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them, saved others, let him save himself. If he be Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar and saying, If thou be he, we save thyself. And a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him saying, If thou be the Christ, save thyself. Okay, and then I'll finish it up at 40 through 49. But the other answered, and rebuking him said, Do you not even fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed are suffering justly. 
for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, excuse me, and he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. It was now about the sixth hour, and darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour. Because the sun fell, or excuse me, because the sun was obscured, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. Verse 46. And Jesus, crying out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hand I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. Now, when the centurion saw what, ha- what had happened, he began praising God, saying, Certainly this man was innocent. And all the crowds who came together for, his, for this spectacle, when they observed what had, what had happened, began to return, beating their breasts. And all, the, all his acquaintances and, women, and the women who accompanied him from Galilee were standing at a distance seeing these things. You know, point point number one, we see that Jesus, his obedience, his obedience. Um, if you would, uh, turn to 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20. I get someone to read First Peter chapter one verse twenty. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Okay, we we see that Jesus dying on the cross, dying on the cross, was in the mind of God, uh, even before the foundation of the world. <clears throat> we see that God was willing to send His one and only Son for our sin. We see this. Also, you know, and, and as we think about this, this is probably hard to comprehend at times, isn't it? What he went through for all of us. You know, we may not know that, uh, I may not know what it would mean to sacrifice a child, but I could only imagine if we could sacrifice, you know, one of our nieces or nephews. You know, I'm, I'm not sure that I could do that. You know, we don't have children, but I don't know what it would like to lose a child. But this kind of paints the picture. You know, you're not sure that we could do that ourselves. You know, one might consider uh, uh, doing it for someone they loved and cared for. However, God sent Christ to die for even the sinners. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. Also, we know that Jesus was all about his father's business, though, don't we? Jesus was about his father's business, even from a young age. Even from a young age. At the age of 12, if you would, go to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. And verses 41 through 49. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when, he came, and when he became twelve, they went up there according to the custom of the feast. And as they were returning, after spending the full number of days, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. But his parents were unaware of it, but supposed, supposed him to be in the caravan and went a day's journey and they began looking for him among their relatives and acquaintances verse 45 when they did not find him they returned to jerusalem looking for him then after three days they found him in the temple sitting in the midst of the teachers both listening to them and asking them questions and all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers When they saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us this way? Behold, your father and I were anxiously looking for you. And then verse 49. And he said to them, Why is it that you were looking for me? Did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? But we know that he was all about his father's business. 
We also see that, you know, before he was betrayed, before he uh, was betrayed, Christ prayed on the mountain of olives that if God was willing to remove the cup from him, if there was another way that this could be done. But ultimately, he finished with not his will, but God's will be done. Luke chapter 22, verse 42. You know, Jesus had a very active prayer life, didn't he? He had a very active prayer life, uh, which ours should be more like him. Our prayer life should emulate Jesus' prayer life. But it should, we should, our prayer should be more like him. As him being the example, we should strive to mimic. You know, another example of this type of obedience is that of Isaac. <clears throat> when his father Abraham was going to sacrifice him in Genesis chapter 22, Verses 1 through 4. Isaac was about 25 to 30 years old. Abraham was about 120 to 130 years, old, years of age. But Isaac could have easily outstrengthened his father. But there was trust Isaac not only had in his father, but also in God. So we see that, you know, can you imagine having to sacrifice your own son. Abraham did. He was willing to do this. He was willing to do it because God, God, God wanted him to. But it worked out for the better for him. It worked out for the better. Sometimes we don't see things like that. We don't look, at, look for things for the better. We look at the negative more than we look at the positive. <clears throat> Second thing that we're going to look at is Jesus' compassion. Jesus' compassion. We clearly see that Jesus had a great love for us. We clearly see this. He had a love for us. He was willing to die on the cross for me and for you. You know, before the cross, he was teaching and trying to save the lost. This was his goal. If you would, turn to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19 and verse 10. Can I get a reader? Luke chapter 19 and verse 10. Someone read this. The Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. That was his goal. That's what he came to do, to seek and save the lost. What are we here to do? What are we doing? This is kind of the same thing that we should be doing, striving to do, striving to seek and save the lost. <clears throat> but this, this, this also should be our goal. What does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to be a Christian? Be like Christ. Be Christ-like. Yes. We should want to go and save souls. More than, more than this, are we not commanded? Are we not commanded to do so? We are commanded by the Great Commission. Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. If you would, let's go ahead and turn there. We... we, we we, sometimes we, we don't realize that this is a command. Matthew chapter, chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This is a command. This is a command, not just to me, but to everyone, that we, that we go and make disciples. <clears throat> and then also we see this in Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16 as well. But Jesus, you know, we looked in chapter 23, Luke chapter 23 earlier, and we see that Jesus had compassion. Didn't he? he had compassion, not just for us, but he had compassion for one of the criminals as well, didn't he? If you, if, if you would, turn back to Luke chapter 23 and look at verses 39 through 43. Luke 
Luke chapter 23, verses 39 through 43. So there, one of the criminals who were, who, who were hanging there was hurling abuse at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other answered and, and rebuking him said, Do you not even fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And, and then verse 41, And we indeed are suffering justly, for we are rec- receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. This criminal here realized what they had done was wrong. Is that not penitent? He had a penitent heart, didn't he? We see that. And then verse 42 and 43. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And he said to him, truly, I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. What a wonderful statement there today you will be with me in paradise now we we do understand that this is under the old law still we understand that this is under the old law and he was in paradise with him with jesus but we understand too uh that uh jesus could only do this he's he, he can do things that we can't but jesus had compassion he felt he had feelings for this this man because he had this man had a penitent heart he knew that he was god in the flesh let's talk about jesus sacrifice jesus sacrifice you know it was foretold before jesus was born it was foretold before jesus was even born <clears throat> If you would, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53, and let's look at five verses 5 and 6. Can I get someone to read this? Isaiah 53, verses 5 and 6. He was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities, crushed for our sins. The things that he went through, I don't think we can paint a good enough picture in our mind of what the things he went through for you and for me. I don't think we can paint a good enough picture. But that should always be in our minds, what he went through for us, for our shortcomings, for our downfalls. He did this for us. But he was pierced for our transgressions and also uh, his, with his wounds we are healed. With his wounds we are healed. You know, the Jews did not accept the Messiah to be a suffering Savior. They figured he would ride, ride in on a white horse and reign on the earthly throne of David. <clears throat> but we, and also, you know, they crucified the Savior. They did so uh, not even knowing that they were fulfilling all the prof- prophecies that were made about him. You know, he gave himself for our sins to deliver us from number one. He did not have to give up all the riches in heaven to come to earth to die an, excru- an excruciating death for us. He didn't have to do this. He did it willfully. He did it willfully. But he did because he had and continues continues to have a great love for us. He has a great love for us. You know, we um, also, I have to question right here, that are we deserving of such love? Are we deserving of that kind of love? Another question we, we, we might ought to think about. Do we, uh, do we ever think about it like that? Are we deserving of that kind of love? So many times we do fall short. But he cleanses us. 
He cleanses us. He cleanses us, makes us free. If we are, if we do things that are wrong, we can pray and and make sure that we repent of our sins. But we we are not deserving of this type of love shown by Christ and God. You know, we are really owed death. We are really owed death. That's our wages. We have been blessed with the choice of a different home for eternity. If you would. Turn with me to Romans chapter 6. Very familiar passage. Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. For the wages of sin is death. For the wages of sin is death. But there's a two part here. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, we can look at that as a bad thing, but there's something to look forward to. We see that the wages of sin is death. If we choose to live a sinful life, then that's what we receive is death. But if we look on the other side of the coin, there's a free gift, free gift of God, and that's eternal life. In Christ Jesus our Lord. What a, and that's a wonderful gift that's given to us freely. Point number four. Let's look at Jesus' humility. Jesus' humility. If you would, turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, and let's read verses 5 through 8. Can I get someone to read this? Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. We see that Jesus humbled himself, humbled himself even to, to the cross, death on the cross. So we read it of that humility there in uh, Philippians chapter two, verses five through eight. You know, we need to have this mind among among ourselves. You know, this is this was in uh, Jesus' mind as well. These, these are things that we need to keep in mind. You know, the crucifixion. Has ha, or had been used by many ancient nations before the Romans adopted it as the most severe form of execution. However, they did not crucify Roman citizens. They used crucifixion for the sla- for slaves, uh, the conquered and common criminals. Victims were nailed to the cross or tied to it and left to die by starvation or exhaustion. Legs were often broken to hasten death because the fractures interfered with the victims being able to elevate their bodies to breathe. If that paints a picture for us, that might just paint a good picture for us of what he might have went through. We can see that the death on the cross, or death on a cross, was commonly reserved for the slaves, the conquered, and the common criminals. Uh, These were crucified and were not very high on the totem pole. They were pretty pretty low. Uh, also, Christ humbled himself, brought himself down to their level, and was crucified. And of course, uh, the cross itself was not holy or magical. It's an instrument of death, the same as gallows, an electric chair, or a needle used in lethal injection. The one who died on the cross is holy, and our salvation is secured. Not by magic or hocus pocus, but by love and sacrifice. It is what he did for us on that cross and must demand our full attention. It must demand our full attention. And in the same sense, we show this same type of humility toward, toward others. 
Christ humbled himself. He left his home in heaven, was born of a virgin in a manger. There was no room for them in the inn. That's why he was born in a manger. Now, last, last thing I might mention here is what his death on the cross means to us. And we discussed this earlier. What his death means on the cross for us. Well, number one, he's the propitiation for our sins. He's the propitiation for our sins. Uh, and not, he's the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. If you would, turn with me to, <clears throat> excuse me, turn with me to 1 John chapter 2. First John chapter 2 and verse 2. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, not only for, not for ours only, but also for those in the whole world. You know, propitiation, what is, what is this? It, it means to praise the wrath of God. He was the only perfect sacrifice that, was, that would appease God's wrath. You know, our sins are part of the nails that held Jesus to the cross. Jesus did what he could not do. For, Jesus did what we could not do for ourselves. Jesus did what we could not do for ourselves. <clears throat> There's an article in, on churchchristarticles.com entitled Nails on the Cross. If you want to look that up sometime, you sure can. Uh, brings out some good points. And that's Church of Christ uh, Articles dot com. Um, also, uh, the Father's will and wish held Christ to the cross. It was the will of God that His Son became the atoning sacrifice for our sins, as we read in First John chapter two, verse two. Also, if you would turn with me to John chapter six. John chapter 6 and verse 38. John chapter 6 and verse 38. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. <clears throat> we see, for I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but for the will of others. He came to do his own will, but not, not his. He came to do God's will. Jesus died to purchase the church with his own blood. He died to purchase the church with his own blood. If you would, turn to Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. I guess someone to read verse 28. Therefore, make ye yourselves with all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. He is the good shepherd. Shepherds his own flock. He is the good shepherd. You know, the church is the institution through which the eternal purpose of God is to be made known to the world. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 10. If you would turn with me there. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 10. Actually, we'll go 8 through 10. Chapter 3, verses 8 through 10. To me, the very least of all saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the un unfathomable unfathomable riches of Christ, verse 9, and to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery, which for ages has been hidden in God, who created all things, so that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. You know, without Christ's death, 
God's purpose for the world would have been aborted. The joy set before Christ held him to the cross. You know, the angry mob, mock, mobs mocking at the cross was ignored because the joy was before him. The joy was set before him. All, all the things that they were saying to him, the mockings, all those things he set aside. He knew his will, that God's will was being done. Then finally, we see the victory that comes from Christ's death on the cross. We understand that death was not able to hold him down or confide him to the grave. If you would, turn with me to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, and we're going to look at verse 24. Acts chapter 2 and verse 24. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. You know, the only place that victory is found is in Christ Jesus. That's the only place where victory is found, in Christ Jesus. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 57. Are there any questions, any comments? You know, we, we definitely, you know, we see the death on the cross, the crucifixion paints a very vivid picture of what he went through for us. Any questions, any comments? So what, I'll ask it one more time. What does the crucifixion mean to you? What does it mean to you? What does it mean to us? We know that we're, we're not deserving of his, this kind of love, but he, he loves us, doesn't he? We see the love, and that ought to put a smile on our face because he knows, we know how much he loves us. Each and every day we strive to live a life of Christ. We know that we're going to fall. But isn't it nice to know that if we're found in Christ, we have that home in heaven someday. Any, any comments, any questions? Yes. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Any other questions or comments? Feel free. I hear that all the time. We have the hope. Well, we can be for sure. Absolutely. Sometimes I've heard members talk like that. We only hope we have that hope in heaven. But we can be for sure. Well, I think we need to talk that way. I think we ought to be sure. We have the hope. We have confidence. Confidence, yes. We need the confidence. We need that confidence. Any other comments? Let's have a word of prayer as we close class. Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to be here to study from your word. We we hope that everything was handled in the right way, Lord, and we know that that you know that uh, you that. We just ask that you'll be with us in this time that uh, we've spent in your word. We thank you for your word and for what it means. Thank you for the crucifixion. Thank you for that, that victory that we can attain.
Lord, in you. Lord, we just ask that you'll be with the, everyone that's here. We ask that you'll be with us throughout the rest of our work week, Lord, and everything that goes on. May we always keep you at the front of our lives. Lord, we just thank you so much for your son's sacrifice, and this we pray in Christ's name.